So this morning we are continuing our little series on this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote, wrote to his protege, young Pastor Titus. And as we saw last week, Titus was a disciple of Paul, probably a convert under his ministry, but he was also a close personal friend. Paul calls him his spiritual child in the faith, or rather verse 4 says his true child in a common faith. So this is a close personal friend as well. But even more than that, he was one of Paul's right-hand men. Someone that Paul could trust to leave in very tough situations. And so we also read in the opening to the letter that faith and deep knowledge of the truth form the foundation of the sound doctrine that Paul wants Titus to be preaching in Crete with all authority. And so we looked at last week how when we join together faith in the gospel with a deep knowledge of who God is as he's revealed in his word, that ought to produce something in our lives, that ought to produce godliness. And if we are people of faith and if we are growing in the knowledge of God and yet there is no fruit or evidence of godliness or holiness or the fear of the Lord in our lives, then that ought to be a warning sign that there's something wrong with that. And so that is the foundation with which the Apostle Paul opens this pastoral letter to young Pastor Titus. Let's just read this short passage again so that it's fresh in our minds as we are about to go through it. This is the Apostle Paul speaking to Titus. He says, The reason I left you in Crete is that you might straighten out what was left unfinished and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. An elder must be blameless, the husband of but one wife, a man whose children believe and are not open to the charge of being wild and disobedient. Since an overseer is entrusted with God's work, he must be blameless, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Rather, he must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, one who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. And so here we see in that last verse, verse 9, we see this key phrase that is not only key to the book of Titus, it's key to the books of First and Second Timothy, which are the other pastoral epistles. This word sound doctrine, which is a dry phrase, I know, but it means healthy teaching. And the reason we have to be so strong on sound doctrine and healthy teaching is so that we can distinguish healthy teaching from unhealthy teaching, so that we can distinguish sound doctrine from doctrine that is false. And so this is a key foundation that Paul is laying for Titus, because Paul has entrusted Titus with a very significant mission. The men, the elders that Titus appoints on the island of Crete by the apostolic authority of the apostle Paul, this will be the foundation for the church in Crete. This will show whether the church in Crete is going to last and flourish and stand strong in the midst of opposition. And so the elders that, that Titus selects are going to be key to the future of the church on this island. And so that is why Paul is, at the very beginning of this letter, is showing Titus how necessary this is. Because... A sound church comes from sound doctrine, and a sound doctrine comes from sound leaders. So that's why Paul begins in this way. And so that's the very first thing that Paul does here in this letter, after the opening, is he explains why Titus was left in Crete in the first place. I sort of get the impression that, that maybe Titus had written a short letter to Paul, and in that letter he was saying to Paul, why on earth have you left me behind in Crete? Maybe not, but I, I like to use my imagination. So Paul replies with this epistle not only to remind Titus why he was stuck in Crete, but also to explain the health and stability of the church. If we want to grow healthy and strong as a church, we will learn from the book of Titus that it all starts with sound doctrine. Because the church is the most stable when healthy leaders stand on healthy doctrine. Mm 
coming from God's holy word. So it is clear that for Titus to be left in Crete, Paul had to have gone through this island beforehand, preaching the gospel and planting churches. And when, when he did this, we don't know, because the Bible doesn't say when Paul went through this island. In the book of Acts, it's recorded that Paul visited the island of Crete, but he did so as a prisoner, a prisoner on his way to Rome to appear before Caesar. But in, the, in Acts, it doesn't mention any time or opportunity for Paul to preach the gospel while he was there. So, therefore, we must assume that it was on a different missionary journey that took him to Crete at a later date after Paul was released from prison. And we know that it was Paul's custom to go through a region and then leave a trusted fellow worker to finish up the work that had already been started. And we see that in the book of Acts, how the author of Acts, who is Luke, the beloved physician, Paul leaves him behind in the city of Philippi while the rest of the group goes on throughout Greece. And so Luke is left in Philippi to continue the work there and build up the ministry and establish good leaders so that the church in Philippi can grow strong. And we see this again with how Paul leaves Timothy, another right-hand man, in the city of Ephesus to strengthen the church there. And so here, too, we see that Paul is acting according to his custom, that Titus has been left in Crete in order to put unfinished tasks in order and to, and to build up the church here. And so that even shows... Paul's heart for his churches. He doesn't just come through very quickly, have a great crusade, and then move on to the next region. Paul also has a concern that his churches will continue on and grow healthy and strong, and that's why he leaves his right-hand men in these places. So if we look at verse 5 in our passage this morning, it also demonstrates to us how Paul viewed the church should be put in order. It is as if we can ask Paul, well, Paul, how do you create and maintain order and stability in the church? How do you do that, Paul? How do we go about doing that? And his answer is, by appointing elders in every town. So Titus has been instructed, or rather he's been entrusted with Paul's apostolic authority for a very important mission, a very important task, and that is to appoint godly men to protect and guide the church as shepherds and to do so with sound doctrine for the sake of order and peace. In 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, Paul says this there, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. And in that context, Paul is talking about worship in the church, how it is to be conducted in an orderly and proper manner. But it's still significant that he puts such a high importance on order in the church. Paul believes that a, a good church is an orderly church. He goes so far to equate it with imitating God's own character. God is a God of order, therefore we should conduct ourselves in an orderly manner. And so in that verse in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul equates order with peace. That if you want peace in the church... You need to have order. And you cannot have true peace in a church unless you have proper and godly order. And James 3.16 also talks about disorder. There, uh, James says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. So for James, what is it that brings disorder, envy, and selfish ambition? And so clearly the Apostle Paul and James are on the same page that disorder was something that they did not want to see happening in the church because disorder disrupts the peace of the church. And so we ask, well, well why not? Why can't the church just be a free-for-all where we're all just all free in Christ under the influence of the Holy Spirit to do whatever we want and say whatever we want, whenever we want and however we want? Why not? Well, it's because this usually or even inevitably leads to an unhealthy situation where unhealthy ideas and unsound doctrine begin to creep into the church and slowly the church then begins to head in a different direction 
that is not in line with the gospel or with the scriptures. So often in the Old Testament, especially in the prophets, the prophets go after the shepherds. And the prophets denounce the shepherds. And of course, they're not talking about shepherds of literal sheep. They're talking about the leaders of Israel. And so often, if you read through the books of, of 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, and 1 and 2 Chronicles, we see that as the king went, so did the nation. So if the king was trying to follow the Lord, like David did, then the nation would generally follow along, even though, of course, there would be dissenters. But if the king was evil, worshipping Baal and the idols of the, nation, of the nations around them, then you can be sure that the rest of the people would be following right along with that king. As goes the leaders, so goes the nation. And that's true of the church as well. And so that is why Paul is talking about order and peace that comes through sound doctrine shared by healthy and sound leaders. So how then is order created and maintained to create health and peace in the church? Well, as we've already said, Paul is, is telling us that it's through the establishment of godly men who tenaciously cling to the word of God and are an example for the church to follow. For Paul knows that the church on the island of Crete will only be as strong and healthy as the elders who are set in place there. He is entrusting Titus with a crucial responsibility. If weak elders and spiritual leaders are appointed there, then the church will fall prey to heresies and false truths and false doctrines that threaten it. Mm. And so in verse 6, Paul begins to describe the kind of men that he wants Titus to appoint as elders in the various towns on the island of Crete where the church is growing. And so Paul begins his description by saying that an elder must be blameless. And notice here that Paul says it twice. He says it in verse 6 and also verse 7. And so that indicates that this is a really important and key point for Paul. This is a primary trait for the appointment of a man to the role of elder in the church. The English Standard Version, if you're reading out of that, it says above reproach. An elder must be above reproach or blameless. Now does that mean that an elder must be perfect and sinless without any weakness of any kind? Well, no, it doesn't mean that, because then Titus wouldn't be able to find any elders on the island of Crete. He wouldn't be able to find any capable men who would meet the standards of being an elder. And then even to this day, we would have no pastors in any churches if the standard was perfection. And even the Apostle Paul himself wouldn't be able to meet that standard of perfection. Because we know from Scripture there are times that he struggled and he stumbled and he made mistakes. So the particular word here, blameless or above reproach, literally means not open to charges, not open to accusations. So it carries the idea that there are no rumors attached to the man, right. that he has good standing in the Christian community, that he has a good name and a good reputation for godliness, and there are no suspicions attached to him. Right. So that's where Paul begins, blamelessness or, or not open to charges or accusations, above reproach. Not perfect, but not rumored either. Notice how the next part of verse 6 begins talking about the man's family. And that might strike us as very curious. Why does Paul then go to the family? Out of all the possible things that Paul could have begun with, he starts with the man's family. He could have talked about the man's education, the man's prayer life, the man's theology, the man's experience, the man's leadership skills, but no, Paul chooses to go right to the family. And I think this brings out a very important point. A man's spiritual health can be measured by his family. For if a Christian husband is the spiritual head of the home, then he is called to a sacred and righteous responsibility of caring for his family and leading them in the fear of the Lord. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul is in that place, he's again describing the role of an elder in the church, and he says, he must manage his own family well, and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Paul says there. 
And here again in Titus, Paul makes the connection between the care of the family and the care of the church. If a man is not properly managing the spiritual growth of his own family, how can he expect to lead the family of the church? And I know in my experience as being part of a pastor's family, because I was a pastor's kid, and, and talking with the children of pastors and missionaries and even Fanny's experience as the daughter of a pastor, we know that so many pastors' families hate being the object of scrutiny. They, it's like the pastor's family lives in a fishbowl. And that can get hard sometimes. And it's true that sometimes, yes, the pastor's family can be put on too high a pedestal and measured against too high a standard of perfection. But still, still, to a certain degree, the family reflects the spiritual leadership of the man. And in many cases, we know this as well, in many cases, pastors neglect their family for the sake of the ministry. And so their children grow up thinking that their father cares for everyone except them. And that's why even many pastors' children turn away from the faith in older age because their fathers put the ministry first. But here in this passage, by putting the family first, I think Paul is also suggesting here that an elder's primary ministry ought to be to his own family first. Verse 7 says that an overseer is entrusted with God's work. Literally, it's saying that the overseer is God's steward or manager. This is always a good thing for any church leader to remember, that ultimately the ministry belongs to God, and the church is under God's ownership, and as leaders we are just stewards and managers of it on the master's behalf. But that's, not, that's true also of quote-unquote regular Christians. Everything that we have is actually belonging to God. And we are stewards or or managers of what God has given us. But there's a special sense for church leaders that even the ministry is a sacred responsibility because it is God's property and we are merely managers of it. And so this task cannot be taken lightly or performed half-heartedly. And everything an overseer does ought to be done as an offering to God for his glory alone. Now you may be thinking, overseer, this is a new word. I thought we were talking about elders here. Why is Paul now talking about an overseer? Is Paul talking about two different roles here in the church? Well, no. We see that the way that Paul connects verses 6 and 7 and indicates for him that the terms elder and overseer were interchangeable. They're the same thing. An elder is an overseer and an overseer is an elder. And this word overseer, episkopos, has been traditionally translated as bishop, especially if you're reading an older Bible. But now the term bishop is, is normally used for a leader who's over several churches, and so we really don't use that term bishop, at least in our denominational context. We simply use the literal meaning, overseer, which has a sense of supervisor. And so you may look around this church, you may see, well, we don't see any overseers around here. That's because we call them pastors or elders. And so we have Brother Phil, who we, uh, under the providence of God, uh, voted to join as an elder in the church because we came to the biblical conviction that there should be a plurality of elders. And I've appreciated his, his help and as a co-worker in the ministry. But then also as a pastor of this church, I am an elder and an overseer. And so you may think at this point, so pastor, this sermon is primarily about you, isn't it? <laughs> so then why do we have to listen? Well, every Christian man here is the elder and overseer of his home. And so he needs to be paying very close attention. And in a wider sense, this sermon is useful so that the church gets to see what it ought to be the expectation of their pastors and elders, according to Scripture. But also, this sermon is for everybody in the fact 
that all these characteristics listed here in this passage are not just for elders, not just for pastors. They're here for all Christians to be pursuing, not just the leaders of the church. Because we could read this and say, ah, the pastor has to be blameless, but I don't have to be blameless. No, all Christians are called to not have suspicions or rumors or not be open to accusation, but especially an elder, especially a pastor. But all these things are true. It's not as though the pastor has to have a godly and spiritual family, but I can let my children run wild because I'm not a pastor or an elder. Mm -hmm. No, of course not. We're all called to train up our children and lead our families in the way they should go. It's just especially that is true of an elder or a pastor or a church leader. And so this is not just about pastors. This is about all of us. And so as we continue in verse 7, Paul lists five negative characteristics. These are things to be avoided, especially for the elder or overseer. But of course, this is true of everyone. It says, not overbearing, not quick-tempered, not given to drunkenness, not violent, not pursuing dishonest gain. Now, I think at least two of these are very obvious. Because you know that you cannot have a pastor who is drunk half the time, and you can't have a pastor who's getting into fistfights every Friday night. That's not a very good pastor. I think we realize that instinctively. Because this is clearly, this does not set a good spiritual example for the church. But let's think of the other traits here. They, they might be a little bit more tricky. For we may see examples of pastors, especially maybe on television, where we see pastors seeking dishonest gain. And I'm sure we've all visited churches where we see the pastor and he sure seems to be acting like a dictator, where it's his way or the highway all the time. Or we may have heard of pastors who have very short fuses and they can freak out over the slightest provocation. But Paul is using these adjectives so that we can get a general sense of what a man's character ought to be for spiritual leadership. And so that doesn't mean that he can't make mistakes once in a while. But it does point to an overall sense of how they carry themselves and how they conduct themselves. And each of these negatives can be flipped over around to a positive that an overseer ought to be humble, slow to anger, temperate, peaceful, and content. But again, I belabor the point that this is true of all of us. Especially true of a pastoral elder, but true of every believer. We should always be seeking humility, to be slow to anger. Just because you're not a pastor doesn't give you license to freak out over the slightest provocation. That we should seek to be sober-minded and temperate. That we should seek to be peaceful and content people. Verse 8 continues on with the description. He must be hospitable, one who loves what is good, who is self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. So this is quite the test, isn't it? And in this list, of course, I see things that I need to continue to work on as a pastor and elder. But before you go down the list to evaluate your pastor, remember, once again, that the pastor is not the only one who should be pursuing these virtues. There is not only one saint in this church. This is a list for everyone. And the problem is, is that in many churches, even in Protestant churches, we can begin to develop this, this problematic idea in our minds where we begin to make, people begin to make this separation between themselves, say on the level of the pew, and then the pastor or the elder, as if he is the holy one, or he is on a different spiritual level than I am, or as if he is the special priest, and I'm just a common churchgoer. And so even in Protestant churches, that separation can creep into our own thinking. And so we may begin to think, my pastor better be all these things on this list. But I don't have to pursue these things. The pastor does, but I don't. 
My pastor better be on his knees in prayer every day and deep in his study of God's word. But you know, I don't really need to do that. I'm really busy. I've got a real job. My, my pastor better be above reproach and pursuing holiness and sharing the gospel. I mean, that's what we're paying the church for. But I'm too busy to do such things. And too often in churches, the pastor is treated as if he is the professional saint, as he is the only saint in the church. But of course, Scripture is clear that we are all called to be saints. We're all called to pursue godliness and holiness. And so what Paul says here of Titus in choosing elders in the island of Crete is a list for us all. We're all called to pursue these things as believers, as saints, as holy ones, as people of Jesus Christ. And so what Paul means here is that Titus is to appoint men and leaders who possess some maturity in these areas so that they can set a good example and help other believers grow in these same areas. Let's, let's look together at verse 9 because here is the key character trait that Titus ought to be looking for when appointing new elders. That the spiritual leader or the overseer or the elder or the pastor must firmly hold to the trustworthy message as it has been taught. Right. So let's look at that. This is the key and primary characteristic. First of all, it says, hold firmly. Have you ever held on to something so tightly that your hands begin to hurt? Well, that's the sense I get here. That you're holding on to something so strongly and so fiercely that you will not let go. And that happens when you value something very highly. So, as all Christians, an elder is to lead in the example of valuing God's word so highly such that he clings tightly to it and will not let it go. Paul is saying that a pastor or an elder must hold on to the trustworthy message with all of his strength because it is so valuable and of such worth. Only by clinging to the truth can we be assured that we are walking in step with our Lord Jesus Christ. Because soon as a leader or an elder begins to hold that truth lightly or loosely, what is going to filter down to the rest of the church? Then all the people are going to start loosening their hold and their grasp on that trustworthy message. Secondly, what is this trustworthy message? Well, it is the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's the gospel that is what the elder is, is to hold on to with all of his might. The good news that God sent his son into the world to live a perfect life, to die on the cross as a sacrifice for sin, to rise again in victory over death, so that we can look forward to his return in glory for salvation from God's wrath on the day of judgment. That is the trustworthy message that we have been taught and that we must cling to at all costs. But of course this points to the wider message because all of God's word ultimately points and finds its culmination in the gospel. And so the trustworthy message is the gospel primarily, but at the same time it is all of scripture because all of Scripture points to Jesus at the end of the day. And so an elder or church leader is meant to cling to Scripture so that he can point others to that and to, to firm up others, other Christians' grasp and hold upon the truth of the Holy Scriptures. Thirdly, it says here, as it has been taught. And so this means that the elders that Titus should appoint have been taught the gospel from Paul, and they should stay true to it. Of course, at this time, they did not have the full New Testament that we enjoy now. Instead, all they had was the gospel. They had the Old Testament, of course, but they had the gospel and the teaching that Paul had personally given them by his apostolic authority. And so Paul says that elders must preserve the purity of, of the teaching and the gospel that they have received, not adding to it and not subtracting from it. Mm 
So not adding to it and not subtracting from it. Let me read to you Paul's reaction. How does Paul react when one of his churches that he had planted was not holding firmly to the gospel as they had been taught it? Listen to Paul's reaction when he finds out about a church not holding on to sound doctrine. Here is his reaction. He says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion or trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than that which you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. That comes from the first chapter of Galatians. That was a church that was loosening its hold on the gospel, on that trustworthy message. And why were the people loosening that hold? Well, we can presume that it is because the elders of that church had begun to loosen their hold on the trustworthy message. And so false teachers were coming in and throwing everyone in, into confusion and beginning to lead them away bit by bit from the true gospel. Nowadays, we don't depend on tradition, or we don't depend on that oral tradition that's being faithfully passed down, because we have the finished canon of the Word of God. We have the New Testament, that under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, faithfully records the words and life of Jesus and the teachings of his apostles. And so in our day, it is God's Word as the apostles taught it, God's gospel, as the apostles taught it, preserved for us in the New Testament scriptures, of course, coupled with the Old Testament scriptures that the elder and overseer must strongly hold on to, to grasp firmly and never let go. So the pastor or the elder or overseer must hold firmly to the gospel as taught, not adding or taking anything away. And the last half of verse 9 gives us the reason here. It says, so that he can encourage others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose it. Mm -hmm. Brothers and sisters, to the believer in Jesus Christ, to the genuine believer, sound doctrine is not something that is old-fashioned or dull. It's not something that's outdated or boring. But rather, sound doctrine is life and its vitality. It is truth and music to spiritual ears and nourishment to the soul. So many churches today are preaching potato chips and Mountain Dew and cotton candy, which may taste good at first and go down easy, but they're never, they'll never fully satisfy and they cannot help you grow strong in the faith. We want to be a church that consistently preaches meat and potatoes and fresh vegetables. <laughs> Sound doctrine and healthy teaching is actually an encouragement to those who fear the Lord. But sound doctrine also guards the truth of the gospel. It guards it, protects it. In order to guard something, you have to know what the opposition looks like. So we need spiritual leaders who can stand up and refute those who oppose sound doctrine and the gospel. So we need spiritual leaders like that. But again, there's application to us in general. Because as a people, our church can only be as healthy as all of us are pursuing sound doctrine. Because what if a spiritual leader, what if a pastor or an elder becomes compromised and starts teaching and leading the flock in the wrong direction and no one in the pew is healthy enough to notice? Because it's the sheep in the pew that can hold the leaders accountable. One of the strengths of our denomination, the fellowship, is that no one can come in from the outside and tell this church what to do. We believe in the autonomy of the local church. Mm 
And so no one from the top in our denomination can come in and say, you need to be doing this and you need to be stop doing this. They can recommend, they can give advice, they can warn, but they cannot tell us what to do. That is a great strength of our denomination. That protects us for sound doctrine, or, or that protects us from bad doctrine filtering in from the top, from the outside, and that protects our church. That's a great strength for our church. However, it's a double-edged sword, and that is also a weakness for the church. Because if this church begins getting rotten in the area of sound doctrine, nobody can come in and tell us to change. Nobody can come in from the outside. Again, they can warn and advise, but if, if there is a spiritual rot that happens with the, the leaders, and that begins to affect the uh, direction of the church, and, and if the sheep in the pew are not noticing this, or they're not healthy enough to notice the difference, and sound the alarm, then an entire church can go off the path. And so that is a call for discernment from all of us. That we are called to stand strong in the gospel and upon the word of God. We live in an age, in a cultural context where anything goes. Where pluralism is honored and valued in the wider culture. Where it seems to be today that the only heresy is saying that there's heresy. And that attitude can very easily creep into the church. The attitude that says, it's okay if you believe your thing and I believe what I want, as long as we love each other. But we see in Scripture here that the Holy Spirit is giving us a standard to look at, to look to in this passage, that there is a right and a wrong. There are correct opinions and erroneous opinions. The correct opinions need to be used for encouragement. The erroneous opinions need to be rebuked and corrected. There is such a thing as sound doctrine. And if there's sound doctrine, that means there's such a thing as unsound doctrine. There is such a thing as absolute truth and falsity. And that is what we are called to pursue. First, at the leadership level, but also the level of the pew. So this is what an overseeing elder is called to pursue for the sake of the flock of God, but not alone. He's to do it along with the flock of God, because he or they are part of the flock of God. I love a quote from Martin Luther. Martin Luther was instrumental in reminding the church of a great doctrine called the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers. So that there's not the laity and then a priest who is a mediator between Christ and God. There's the priesthood is all genuine believers. Every person here today who is a believer in Jesus Christ is a priest before God. And we only have one high priest, and that is Jesus Christ. And so we see that doctrine especially in the book of 1 Peter. And Martin Luther was instrumental in reminding the church of that doctrine. But he also said this, that a pastor is a pastor pastorum, which means that a shepherd, or the pastor is a shepherd of shepherds. A pastor is a pastor of pastors. Because when we truly understand the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers... That really means, in a certain sense, that we are all pastors here. We are all called to shepherd. Shepherd our own souls. Shepherd our families. Shepherd each other in the context of small groups and Bible studies. To shepherd one another, even here in the church, in the fellowship that we enjoy. We are all called to be shepherds, pastors of one another. Maybe with a small p. There are, there are people who are called to be capital P pastors. But that doesn't create this division between pastors, the super saint, and, and the common Christians on a different level. No. We are all called to be priests before God, to pursue holiness, to pursue the encouragement and edification of one another as we all chase after God. So as we close this morning, what are some points of application that we can take away from this passage this morning. 
We've touched on a few of them, but I just want to bring them together here at the end. First of all, one point of application is don't view your pastor and your elders as the only ones who have to pursue these characteristics that we've seen in this passage today. Pursue them alongside your pastor. Because your pastor is a sheep also. So this passage does speak to everybody, even though it primarily is speaking to church leaders. A second point of application is, is support your pastor and elders and church leaders. How? Through prayer, of course. But according to this passage, support your pastor and elders by holding firmly to the gospel alongside them. Because imagine how hard it would be in the church if the pastor and elders are trying their best and hardest to hold on to the gospel, but none of the sheep in the pew are. Mm -hmm. So one of the greatest ways you can support your church leaders is by having that conviction, I want to hold on to the gospel just as firmly as they are. Mm -hmm. Because that is a calling for all of us, to hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it is taught us through Scripture. Thirdly, an application for all of us is be encouraged by sound doctrine. If, if you have that, rea that reaction, and I've had it in my life as well, that when you hear the term sound doctrine, it's like your brain shuts off. And you go, okay, here we go. And try to crush that attitude and, and try to say, wow, so sound doctrine, that's exciting. I want to hear more of that. First, your pastor will have a heart attack, and then he'll recover, and then we'll, we'll continue on. But, but we can change that attitude in our lives. You know, I've shared with my wife that the book of Leviticus, I did not like. And I think she shares that opinion, or she used to. But for a long time, you know, the book of Leviticus, I'd start my Bible reading very well in the year, then I'd hit Leviticus, and it'd all sort of fall apart. But you know, I can't say Leviticus is my favorite book in the Bible now, but I love the book of Leviticus now. But I, and one of the reasons I did is because I had to change my attitude about it. I, ha I had to actually say, this is God's word, this is important, there's a reason why the Holy Spirit included this book, and I have to find out what it is. And I, I have to start with a better attitude. And so that just teaches me that we can actually change our attitude about certain things. So that's the encouragement. That if, it, if that is your reaction when you hear the word sound doctrine... That's like when I hear about math, my mind shuts down. If we have that reaction to sound doctrine. We can choose to change that attitude and say, no, I want to know more about sound doctrine. I want to understand more about who God is because God is a God of truth. He's a God of consistency. And sound doctrine is actually the enjoyment of the consistent truth of the living God. So let's hunger and let's thirst after sound doctrine. And let us sorrow over those areas that there, we may have lack of understanding and, and lack of sound doctrine in our lives. Let us chase after and hunger and thirst after it. And fourthly, uh, an application we can take from this is choose or try not to be an extra burden to your church leaders by opposing sound doctrine or by thinking that sound doctrine is something worthless or boring or old-fashioned. Because you know it, it's hard, again, to be a pastor or an elder or a church leader and to be wanting to be passionate and zealous about Scripture and about the Gospel and to hold strongly to the trustworthy message. And I'm not saying that this happens in this church. But it's, it can be very hard when you look out and everybody ha has their eyes glazed over and you can tell they're thinking about lunch or they're they're shuffling in, in the seat, and you know they want to go. Because what does that do to a leader? It says, well, why am I holding on so tightly? And so we can choose to be a burden, or we can choose to be an edification to our leaders. And again, I have been very blessed by our church family and by the growth that I've seen among us in this area, and I praise the Lord over it. But it's just a reminder that sometimes... Our attitude towards these things can even be a burden and affect our leaders. And I know I've done that in my own life in churches that I've attended in the past, where I was more a burden 
than I was an edification. And I regret that for myself. I've tried to learn from that. So be an encouragement to your church leaders by not opposing sound doctrine as something worthless or boring or old-fashioned. What a wonderful thing to see in this church if we could all get excited about sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. And that would be just by the grace of the Holy Spirit working among us. Because sound doctrine glorifies God who is sound himself. Mm -hmm. So the sounder we are in our faith is actually an act of worship to worship and love the God who is sound himself. Mm -hmm. Let us pray. Father God, thank you once again for your word, your mighty word, for this pastoral epistle of, of Titus. And Father, today we've seen how these words are primarily directed towards me as a pastor, towards Phil as my fellow elder, towards our deacons, towards our directors and coordinators and, and fellow leaders serving at different Levels, And we appreciate them all, Father. We're so thankful for all those who serve and get involved and help shoulder the burden of ministry here. And so we see, Father, that this is not just to the leaders at the top, although it applies directly to them, but that it does apply to all of us, Father. That we should be hungering and thirsting after sound doctrine, that we should be joining our leaders in clinging tightly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, that we ourselves should be seeking after blamelessness so that we are above reproach, that our families are growing spiritually healthy and strong, that we are not given to a quick temper, that we are showing uh, uh, hospitality and all these things in this list, that we are pursuing godliness that comes out of genuine faith joined with a knowledge and deep knowledge of the truth. And so, Father... I pray that this message would be an encouragement to us as we leave this place. It may be strange to have a message about overseers in the midst of this lockdown and COVID time. But Father, your word is profitable no matter what it teaches, and no matter what situation we find ourselves in, Father. And so even in this time of continued lockdown and continuing to have to wear masks and have that extra mindfulness about those around us and how it can be very tiring and, and burdensome, Father. We still see your faithfulness at work, that you are a God of order and a God of peace, and you've called us as a church to continue to preserve the gospel and a gospel witness through the way that we conduct ourselves in the church on Sunday mornings and in the church as we are throughout the week, in our individual lives and families. And so, Father, we pray for the grace to continue to grow in strength, in our faith, and in our knowledge of that trustworthy message. For, Father, how can we cling or hold fast to a trustworthy message if we don't know it very well? How can we cling to the truth if we're not well-versed in it? And so, Father, may this be a conviction on all our hearts that not only do we want to love sound doctrine more and, and hunger and thirst after it, but we want to know it better so that we can know you. Mm -hmm. So that it won't just be a matter of, of trivia or of knowledge for its own sake, but we're pursuing sound knowledge because we want to know the God who is sound. We want to know the God who is truth and love and goodness and holiness. And so, Father, we pray that you would convict our hearts this week to give us a renewed passion and a renewed zeal for your gospel and for your word so that we may be a people, a flock of sheep under one chief shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ, who cling to sound doctrine and the trustworthy message of the gospel found in your holy word. And may we not add anything to it. May we not subtract anything to it. All for the glory of your holy name. Father, I pray you bless each one as we leave this place. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.